Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our event on Black Lives Matter, Understanding the Movement and the Protests. I am Dr. Tumika Robinson, an Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Public Advocacy. I am also the Director of our Speech and Debate Program. I am joined this morning by my colleagues, Dr. S.M. Rodriguez, who is an Associate Professor of Sociology and Criminology, and Cornell Craig, who is our Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Hofstra. So the way that this morning's event is going to work is that each of us will give our prepared remarks, and then we will open it up to having answering the questions that are put into the U YouTube chat. So make sure you put your questions in there. And after we finish with all three of our speakers, we will come back and answer any of the questions that have been put forth and our moderators will give us the questions. After the death of George Floyd on March 25th, an event that many of us saw as we scrolled through our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter feeds in its brutal entirety, in cities across the United States, Tens of thousands of people have swarmed the streets to express their outrage and sorrow. Some have attributed the protests to the Black Lives Matter movement, while some who are parts of Black Lives Matter chapters have been involved with the protests. There is much more at play here. My colleague, Dr. Rodriguez, will give some more context to the actual protests in a few moments. But today, my purpose is to provide some more insight and context into the actual Black Lives Matter movement. So first I'll start with some background and history. In 2013, three black women organizers, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tumeti, created a black centered political will and movement building project called Black Lives Matter. This was following the 2013 acquittal of George Zimmerman, a Florida man who was shot and killed Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager the preceding year. Garza took to social media the night of the acquittal, stating in part, black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter. A year later, Michael Brown, another unarmed black teenager was shot and killed by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. As we know, this officer was also acquitted. Shortly thereafter, the internet was filled with messages of outcry and support that included the hashtag Black Lives Matter as people took to the streets of Ferguson and St. Louis to protest this acquittal and were brutalized by law enforcement, criticized by the media tear gas and pepper sprayed night after night. Seeing this violence, Black Lives Matter co-founders organized a national ride during Labor Day in Ferguson called the Black Life Matters Ride. In 15 days, they developed a plan of action to head to the occupied territory to offer support. Over 600 people gathered. After leaving Ferguson, the co-founders saw a need to continue organizing and building Black power across the country as people were hungry to galvanize their communities to end state-sanctioned violence against Black people. In the aftermath of Ferguson, national attention turned to the killings of other Black men, women, and children, such as Eric Garner in Staten Island, New York, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio, and Sandra Bland in Prairie View, Texas. As the Black Lives Matter movement developed through 2013 and 2014, they utilized it as a platform and organizing tool. Other groups, organizations, and individuals use this platform to amplify anti-Black racism across the country in all of the ways it showed up. The Black Lives Matter movement is an ideological and political intervention where according to their website, in a world where Black lives are systemically and intentionally targeted for demise, it is our affirmation of Black folks' humanity, our contributions to the society, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. The project is now a member-led global network of more than 40 chapters. 
So people who do not follow the movement usually become aware when news sites report on actions or protests that they attribute to the movement, whether it's true or false. What many people do not realize is that the movement is not just about protests, but also embraces policy change and legislation as necessary elements. One common misconception about the Black Lives Matter movement is that it is leaderless, but there isn't one leader, there are many. Black Lives Matter is composed of many local leaders and many local organizations, including Black Youth Project 100, the Dream Defenders, the Organization for Black Struggle, Hands Up United, Millennial Activists United, just to name a few. Another misconception is that the movement is solely for protests. However, the many people and organizations involved with the movement have produced detailed policy demands and proposals for institutional reforms. Campaign Zero, for example, outlines a list of policy demands and proposals for institutional reforms largely focused on ending police brutality. But police brutality is not the only focus. The Movement for Black Lives, which is a collective of more than 50 organizations, advances a platform covering six, covering six areas of domestic police reforms, including economic justice and investment in equitable education and healthcare, instead of criminalization and incarceration. Despite all of this incredible work, however, there are some that view the movement as being violent, seeking to sow a racial divide and intent on interrupting the work of police officers. For example, Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York City, said in a television interview that the movement is inherently racist and divides us. He further stated, they don't mean Black Lives Matter. They mean let's agitate against the police matters. Another criticism of the movement is that it should be more like the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. It is important to note that the same criticisms being leveled against the leaders of Black Lives Matter were also leveled against Dr. King, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and other civil rights activists and groups. These critiques include that protesters cause unrest they don't respect authority and do more harm than good by taking to the streets and causing problems. And more contemporarily, we see that these same critiques were lodged against Colin Kaepernick and others that took a knee during sporting events. The photos of the marches of the 1960s are great, but what media and others don't wanna talk about is the police dogs and fire hoses that followed each of these marches too. Still, perhaps the gravest criticism and misunderstanding of the movement stems from a failure to acknowledge the conditions that created the resistance. In a speech given at the 2016 BET Awards, activist and actor Jesse Williams addressed this disconnection. He stated, if you have a critique for the resistance, for our resistance, then you better have an established record of critique of our oppression. Without an understanding of the ever-present effects of slavery and the systems that have been built to protect and preserve the devaluing and oppression of Black bodies, Black Lives Matter and any other movement for rights concerning people of color in this country will never be understood. This context is necessary to understand which is why in 2020, the movement is still called Black Lives Matter because historically, Black lives have not mattered. The most common criticism leveled against the Black Lives Matter movement is that the movement is racist because it focuses on Black people. The Black Lives Matter hashtag is often met with the counter slogan, all lives matter. And while some would argue that this is to make the message more universal, it is inherently racist because it depoliticizes and deracializes an entire movement. The movement is literally to underscore and provide tools for organization and advocacy 
to analyze the ways that black bodies have been systemically targeted and erased in this country, whether through criminal justice, education, or through our healthcare systems. All lives cannot matter if black lives do not. And to educate the critic about the conditions that ignited the resistance. Hence why we're talking about it today. The Black Lives Matter movement is rooted in the deeply humanistic belief that all lives are connected. All oppression, including that of LGBTQ individuals, refugees, immigrants, Muslims, Jews, women, people living in poverty and people with disabilities, negatively affects all lives. So yes, I proudly say Black Lives Matter and promote the liberation for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, for that. Um, I think that, that context really, really matters and it's really important to, um, to frame things as such. Um, the direction where I'm going and the direction of, of my uh, brief talk here is going to really be about the, the historical context um, and how we got to where we are, why we must say Black Lives Matter and, and what uh, institutional policies, what uh, practices have led to really the, the larger society um, not really reinforcing that idea. Um, and we look back to the really the precursor to what our current uh, police system is based on. And we, we look back to slave patrols. And slave patrols were uh, a situation where you had really working class uh, white men uh, protecting the wealth of, of wealthy white men. Um, and, the, and the wealth was making sure that slaves and those who uh, work to free slaves or lead to any type of uh, liberation of slaves um, were those those movements were stopped and those movements were, were kept down. Um, you move from there, you move from uh, slave patrols to uh, post-Civil War, um, post-Emancipation uh, Proclamation, per, post uh, the 13th Amendment, and you have Black Codes. And Black Codes were laws that were in place um, in local jurisdictions that made simple crimes against the law for Black people to uh, to loiter, to stand around, to congregate in, in groups. It was against the law and, and individuals could be arrested. Um, the, uh, the, the criminalization of blackness really started then from a legal perspective. Um, being black, you, weren't, you didn't have the access and the opportunity to do the things that uh, white citizens um, had access to. You fast forward. I'm going, I'm going to fly through time here. I'm going to show you a timeline as well in, in, a, in a few minutes. But moving far forward into the 1970s and, and with President Nixon, and you have the war on drugs. Um, and a, the war on drugs, which a lot of people equate and identify now as a war on black communities, black and brown communities, and a war on poverty, on being poor. Um, so it was, it was criminalizing um, those communities and criminalizing uh, poverty. And you have the rhetoric that continues since Nixon, since his Southern strategy, uh, talking about toughness, being tough on crime for politicians, um, law and order. Law and order and toughness on crime means one thing to the majority of the, of the white population. It may mean I don't want criminality to uh, negatively impact me. Um, but the implication, how it was applied, uh, was really a focus and a targeting on black and brown communities and, and poor communities as well. Um, from 1980 to, to 2015, uh, the nation's prison population climbed uh, roughly 500, 000, by 500,000 people um, to more than 2.2 million. And black Americans, which make only make up 13% of the population, um, filled 34% of, of the prison population. Um, so that disparity that's shown uh, throughout the levels. One of the things I talk about a lot, and one of the things a lot of um, social justice workers uh, talk about is the four eyes of oppression. Um, the four eyes of oppression, the first eye is ide ideological, the ideology of, of oppression. And this applies for any system of oppression. You have to have the ide ideology, the thoughts. Um, the second is institution, 
institutionalization of the ideology. So you have, you have laws in place, you have uh, structures within the society that support this ideology, um, that carry it forward, um, to put restrictions, put boundaries on behavior, on actions, on access. Uh, the third eye is interpersonal. So once you have the ideology, then you have institutions support it, and then you have individuals carry out and reinforce that behavior to, to other individuals that are, that are marginalized or oppressed within society, um, that, that carries it through. That's that tangible aspect um, that we often focus on. Um, and the fourth eye of oppression is internalized, um, where the individuals who are marginalized or oppressed within society take on the societal perspective of who they are and their, and their own value within the society um, and begin to not only personally uh, oppress the self, but also oppress others who are in marginalized groups. Um, and this, this has happened. This is why it's important to say Black Lives Matter. Um, it's not only a call and a cry externally, it's also a call and a cry internally, um, saying I matter, I'm a value, um, in, independent of what um, the larger society uh, may present. Some of the other institutional aspects, and this is a huge, huge piece, is how the GI Bill um, was distributed um, when, it, when it became a part of the, the New Deal um, and how FHA loans providing home ownership um, were distributed and, and, and redlining, um, the way banks mark territories as if they had black, a black family, a black owned house within that area, it was immediately marked, with, with, um, marked as red, as a red community um, where loans would not be um, available. Uh, to individuals. Um, the government backed $120 billion in mortgages from 1934 to 1962. Um, but the race-based policies meant that for the first 30 years um, of, of the government-backed FHA um, loans and mortgages, less, fewer than 2% went to um, Black home buyers. fewer than 2%. Um, so when we talk about the redistribution of wealth, when we talk about uh, taking money from one area and putting it in another area, this has happened historically, um, but it's happened out, it, money's been taken out of black communities, out of tax, the tax base within black America and redistributed elsewhere. And black commun the black, black community has not benefited or profited from not only their hard work and contributions within society, but also um, not benefited from uh, institutional opportunities like FHA loans and, and GI Bill. Um, and this led, when you have redlining, it leads to the concentration of poverty and segregated communities. Um, we, can, we can look at Long Island, we can look at communities across the country um, and look at how much segregation still exists. You look at segregation within, within home ownership, which also leads to the tax base for schools. And then you also look at the segregation of schools. Schools conti continue to be, K through 12 schools continue to be very segregated um, based on race. Um, so this also impacts home ownership and, and home ownership leads, impacts wealth. Um, wealth, of course, being, being the, the bigger picture of, of value that, that a person uh, represents a person's um, a income. It's not just income, it's income. It's, it's um, all the things as far as home ownership and all the things that contribute um, to, the, to the income of the family. Um, home ownership gap between blacks and whites has widened, and this is since 20, 2004, has widened, and families are less likely, black families are less likely than white families uh, to own their house. Today, 41% of black households um, are, are own their own home, uh, compared to 72% um, for whites. And really quickly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen here. Um, this will work. Let's see if this technology will work. I think we're working here. Um, and I, I just like to share this to really give a, give a perspective of where we are and how, um, how the timeline of oppression, segregation, um, racism, and institutional slavery uh, has been laid out. From 1619 to 1865, 246 years, we have institutional slavery um, within this country. 1865, 1968, legalized Jim Crow laws and limitations around black identity, black families, black personhood. And I'm being generous with, with things cutting off in 1968. Um, 
of course, we have you, you see a lot of the prison industrial complex and the new Jim Crow, which uh, really lays out um, the, the storyline of why things don't stop in 1968. But I'm just choosing 1968. That's when the Fair Housing Act was signed. You have you have the all the civil rights bills that, that were passed in the in 60, 64, 65. And we'll just stop at 68 just to make things clean. It's only been 52 years <laughs> to 2020 um, since 1968. That's that's 52 years, and we're not counting any other types of discrimination and and, and marginalization which happened but since '68 to now. Um, but a lot of times the argument is that Black lives, of course, matter. Um, we don't need any type of particular movement. We don't need any particular action because Black lives matter. Everyone is even. I don't see color. Well, everything sees color in the, in the history of, of of America. Everybody sees color. The laws see color. And if we just stop in 1968 only 52 years. Um, and there's still some challenges uh, therein. So I'd like to share that um, just to give a, a visual representation of, of what we're looking at and why it's important that we give issue and focus on not just today. Today is a result of, of the past. Today is the residue or the, the leftover from our, from our history. We're still impacted by that long history. Um, and see that the my, my last point that I'll, I'll make here, going back to how the um, institutionalized inequality becomes normalized inequality, and we just look at individuals, we look at communities as um, inherently where they are within our society and their, their station in our, in our country. Um, currently, the median net worth of white families is $171,000 take in all of what they have and all of what they owe, all their assets, all their liabilities, and the median net worth of white family is $171,000. The median net worth of black families is $17,600. That's one-tenth of, of the median net worth of white families. Black lives must matter, and they must matter across the board. They must matter uh, economically. They must matter um, how we in engage and interact with the law. They must matter how we engage and interact with, um, with officers or agents of the law. Um, and they must matter with access and opportunity, access and opportunity to our institutions, to higher education, to education, um, to healthcare. Um, it, it must matter. And it's important that the citizens of this country who hold true and hold the value of, of freedom and opportunity um, as, a, as a root value within, the, within our society, uh, reinforce that. So we can't be what we are or what we what we hope to be, what our motto, what our promise is to be for, our, for every citizen in this country if Black lives don't matter. And we have to take every step to make sure and reinforce that. This goes to uh, police brutality, police killing Black men, but it also goes beyond that and goes into our institutions and how we, and who's protected you know, by our institutions. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Rodriguez to, to take us to the next step. But I hope there are some questions that are being generated um, because I, I, I want this dialogue to, to continue. It's, it's a robust, robust conversation, but I have to cut myself short. I kind of get a little long-winded sometimes. So I'm gonna hand it over to, to Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. No, Cornell, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually, uh, well, I want to say I'm an assistant professor of sociology and criminology. Um, I'm also the director of LGBTQ studies at Hofstra. Um, and for me, that's, that's very much intertwined with the work that I do um, uh, when it comes to criminalization, racialization, et cetera, that I'll talk about right now. So yes, thank you for the tenure and promotion, <laughs> Dr. Robinson. Um, so um, I'll, I'll begin with just saying that um, for this talk, I'll just be outlining some overarching issues with uh, labeling and criminalization uh, that we're hearing from um, uh, my colleagues. And also think about how does that apply to the protests that we're seeing right now? Um, and I will talk about Black Lives Matter um, as a rallying cry. And I do want to end with uh, some suggestions uh, for those of you who have been asking about uh, white privilege and mobilizing whiteness and doing uh, uh, work 
uh, anti-racist work as an ally. Um, so I'll begin with saying that labeling uh, and criminalization from my discipline, sociology, um, really work to uh, suppress, sequester, and, uh, and apply perpetual punishment onto people. And we see this in this context um, as uh, uh, one that is anti-Black and notably anti-Indigenous. And I think that's really important as we think about um, uh, Indigenous people in the land that we are currently on, but also, uh, what indigeneity and black indigeneity looks like around the world. Um, so when I say black lives matter, um, I'm, I'm actually talking about all black lives. Um, and I do think it's very important for us to understand um, and kind of grow off of this analysis, right? Uh, Dr. Robinson said, you know, uh, all lives matter cannot matter. All lives cannot matter until black lives matter. Um, Simultaneously, Black lives cannot matter until the most marginalized within us matter, right? And so within that, I'm thinking through those who have been criminalized, those who um, uh, are, trades, are in trades and professions that are looked down upon, like sex work, those who are um, not working or unemployed, those who have embraced um, violence or even self-defense, right? Because uh, those uh, that embrace as a political strategy or as a, as a response to the violence that one uh, experiences in the United States today, oftentimes uh, leads to or is used as a justification of the violence that one experiences. So I'll say that, um, you know, labeling, applying a label onto a person um, doesn't actually require any type of transgressive act. Um, Black people experience uh, the United States through the lens of labeling from the point that they are babies, long before they actually do anything, which is why we see Black children disproportionately um, being harmed by the police um, and not having any type of um, really chance to even develop selfhood, right? Um, and I'm saying this with in mind, of course, uh, Tamir Rice, just um, bringing him into this space and into this discussion, um, but the many black children that experience violence at the hands of the state. Um, we know that people also respond to labeling uh, either through a forceful rejection of that or by leaning in or adopting those labels. Um, so criminalization is the act of uh, transforming an action or a person into a crime or into a criminal. And people are transformed, particularly black people are transformed into criminal, right? Um, regardless of any type of law breaking that they may have or may not have engaged in, in their lives. That is what happens as the lasting truth of uh, anti-black labels in the United States and the way that criminalization or this term criminal has been used to justify uh, state violence and also uh, white supremacist violence on black and indigenous populations in the United States. Now, um, we also see how movements can be labeled. So if we think about these protests right now, um, there's a very delicate dance that's happening uh, to, um, to uh, discuss or validate the movement, right? Any form of violence or property damage, um, which I do wanna say property damage um, is, is not inherently violent, um, but any type of property damage that we might witness uh, has led to many people saying that, oh, well, these you know, Black Lives Matter movements are violent and terrible, and therefore they uh, deserve the treatment that they get. But what's really important to hold on to is that protests in American history um, have a very radical, uh, a very revolutionary potential. All of um, the, the most... Uh, the moments that have heightened social change or um, we have aggressively um, uh, uh, shifted what our system looks like has been a result of large scale protests um, or other forms of organized revolutionary struggle. 
in this country. And so with that radical potential of a protest comes uh, the state response, which is to label and criminalize that, that action, that collective action. So we witness today a collective struggle that is not actually just of uh, Black people, but is actually a multiracial coalition of many organizations with many interests that are against state violence. Um, therefore, what we see is that the state responds uh, with myth-making and their myth-making tools that they have, which uh, largely can be through the media or can be through the criminal justice system um, and the formation and, and enforcement of laws themselves, even if those laws are unjust, right? And so we see the state respond so severely to these protests and I, I want to remind you all that that is actually a testament to the radical and revolutionary potential of a mass movement. Um, as our history shows, worker rights came um, and unionization came through mass movement, um, civil rights, um, you know, <laughs> well, the, the United States of America, right? A revolution, uh, a violent revolution. Um, so, what happens is that uh, the state kind of puts its resources, uh, mobilizes its, its power into uh, denouncing protests of this scale. And we're witnessing that with all of the, um, uh, the rhetoric that we see within uh, uh, media, but we also see with uh, you know, people who are uh, more right-wing or conservative embracing um, to denounce Black Lives Matter, but also denounce all of the protesters that are in the street today. Um, so part of that, right, part of uh, the effect of myth-making um, from the state is actually being witnessed today, which is the militarization of the police. Um, we have a police force that has received billions of dollars um, worth of resources from uh, the Department of Homeland Security, Pentagon, um, over the last 30 years or so um, in order to quell any potential uprising that may happen uh, domestically or any large scale change. And so that's why we see these armored vehicles, we see tanks, we see riot shields, we see, um, uh, we even see lethal force being um, uh, applied, you know, and I do want to, uh, I do want to um, even bring uh, Justin Howell into this space who recently was hit in the back of his head and is now in critical condition from a non-lethal uh, weaponry that was used by the police. Um, when we see this type of militarization, please know that it's testament to the radical potential. All right, um, of Black Lives Matter, but also of the protesters, all of the protesters who are on the ground today. Um, so I'm going to share with you a, a visual aid that I created uh, that I do hope helps give you a sense of the, the scope of what we're experiencing today. So I made this uh, All Black Lives Matter reading and resource list, and you'll be able to find it on my website, which is uh, uh, smrodriguez.com. I'm missing a W on there. It's www, not just two Ws, smrodriguez.com. And then you can click the tab for public sociology if you'd like to follow along on there. Um, what I did was I collected readings that mean a lot to me. This is not an exhaustive list at all, but I collected readings that mean uh, you know, a tremendous amount, I think, to this movement, but also um, uh, to this moment where we're seeing a, a global collective uh, respond to what's happening. And what I wanted to make sure to do within this reading list was to actually include resources that um, aren't only speaking to the United States, but are speaking to the African diaspora altogether. So that when we proclaim that Black Lives Matter, we are actually talking about Black lives, not necessarily um, just in the United States or not necessarily just of um, middle-class Black lives or anything of the sort. Um, and so what we see is actually 
over 100 years of readings um, just collected here that speak to the diasporic issues that actually devalue Black lives, but also the way that Africans throughout the diaspora have organized, um, um, you know, and I want to give a particular shout out to Black women um, who have done this revolutionary organizing for uh, the last century. Um, so the page that I give here, um, is an organization and campaign list, also not exhaustive at all. And I will say, um, speaking of exhaustion, I was exhausted when I wrote this. So this is not actually, none of this is, is properly in alphabetical order. Um, you will see an A in the middle of, uh, of this list. Um, shout out to being tired. Uh, <laughs> but um, the reason that I use this list is so that wherever you are, you can see where you can kind of lean into organizations. There are many people right now who are wondering, how do I get involved? Especially if I don't have a Black Lives Matter local chapter. Black Lives Matter has transformed into a rally cry akin to uh, Black is beautiful or um, Black power. Right? That doesn't mean that everyone on the ground right now is actually affiliated with a Black Lives Matter uh, local chapter. So there are organizations, like Dr. Robinson said, actually, um, that have existed long before, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter um, uh, was founded um, and quite a few of them I put on this list. This list is New York heavy um, because it was in response to uh, students who were asking me, hey, how do I get involved? Okay, so I will say that. Um, but I do want to give a, a, um, a sense of the organizations in various countries that are making sure to amplify and uplift this work, but also to apply it to their own settings. And so when we say Black Lives Matter, it's, it's, it's critical that we understand that um, this includes uh, African lives, it includes incarcerated um, Black people, it includes, well, it inc includes everyone incarcerated, but it includes incarcerated Black people who are doing this organizing work, um, even behind bars. Um, so here, I'll just leave that there so that you have uh, a sense of that. Um, so. Black Lives Matter is a global movement. And I think recently we can see that um, the solidarity struggles that are coming out, even, um, you know, the, the Maori uh, uh, and the other Aboriginal groups in Australia, in New Zealand, who are um, uh, asserting this forcefully, even in their performances on the street in protests. Um, but we're also seeing it through um, various, uh, like Brittle Paper actually published a few days ago, um, a collection of African authors who were standing in solidarity throughout their countries. Um, so we're seeing this in Europe. Um, I was just recently, uh, uh, I recently saw uh, Forefront, with, which is an organization in London that's making sure to point out the way that police brutality actually functions in their context, uh, because what happens oftentimes when we experience um, the type of state-sanctioned state killing that we did here is that people believe that the United States is in some way alone um, in this uh, uh, struggle, and it's, it's just not. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, close out just by offering a few um, resources for those of you who have been asking, uh, how do I have these conversations with other white people? Um, how do I understand uh, uh, my own kind of white privilege within this? How do I um, effectively ally. And so I, I'm just giving you a few resources because it's really important to be aware of um, how one is, is, is situated within this um, uh, current movement, but also our politic of the day. Um, so I'm going to stop share, but like I said, you can find that on the website. Um, I'll just close out by saying that we can't actually value, it's not in the best interest, it's not in anyone's best interest to value order over humanity, 
Okay, this is not, uh, that's not something that you would request of your heroes, historically speaking. Um, and I say that, and it actually doesn't matter who your hero is for the most part. <laughs> they were about collective struggle, all right? Um, and I'll also say that by saying Black Lives Matter, I just wanna reiterate this with what um, Dr. Robinson said, by saying Black Lives Matter, we are not saying that all lives do not matter or other lives or non-Black lives do not matter, okay? It's that all lives cannot matter if Black lives do not matter. And I do wanna point out the fact that the types of, um, the types of uh, change that Black Lives Matter and those who are organizing under this rallying cry are embracing affect the whole world, right, positively. They affect the United States positively. They affect your locale positively because, uh, you know, it's very important to understand that unlike race specific legislation that we experienced during Jim Crow. Um, uh, Michelle Alexander actually lets us know the new Jim Crow um, is colorblind. Okay, and I'm not saying that as in, I personally don't see color. Hold on to uh, uh, this, <laughs> the, the four eyes as presented by Cornell Craig, all right? That you cannot just say individually, I don't see it and then ignore ideology, institutions, what was the last one? An internalization, <laughs> okay? Um, you can't, it, it, it makes no sense and it also affects no positive change. And uh, the new Jim Crow with uh, Michelle Alexander shows that that's actually, um, uh, colorblindness is a very tricky form of racism that actually does have the potential to affect all. So even though uh, the types of legislative changes, the militarization of the police, et cetera, disproportionately affect black people by rallying against that militarization or that mass criminalization, we create a better world for all people. Because as you see today, which I think is probably one of the first times that we've seen in history, um, is everyone is seeing that no one is safe from this violence, all right? Uh, you know, we are witnessing, uh, uh, you know, old white grandpas being knocked over, uh, knocked unconscious, unconscious. Uh, we are seeing children being harmed. Um, this is every scale, okay? So it's very important to understand that what happens with colorblind legislation is that even though it disproportionately affects racialized people, that does not mean that it cannot affect white people, okay? So these types of changes um, that are being uh, demanded by uh, protesters today are actually wide scale changes to affect positive change to our entire system. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, very good information from, if I can put myself into the category of, of the great thinkers on my panel with me. Um, great, great tips and great advice. What we really wanna do now is really open up the floor you know, I think the dialogue aspect and the feedback is, is very important to uh, sharing information and to, to push ideas, thoughts forward. I mean, it, it goes both ways. It goes from, from the questions and the information we're getting, re receiving, and also what we can give back. Um, the first question, and I, if I mess up a name, please forgive me. Um, I believe it's Marichelle, um, advice for educators of predominantly white populations, of predominantly white populations, to bring the Black Lives Matter movement in light to light in a way that will encourage students to learn more rather than become defensive. So how can we bring the Black Lives Matter movement um, in a way that can be more inclusive, bring people in rather than make individuals, especially from the white population, defensive? Who wants that? So I'll jump in, but I first want to highlight 
that my colleague, Dr. Rodriguez, just provided a, a great resource of that. So I know that the question was asked before, but there are entire toolkits that are available in multiple different spaces, specifically for how to talk to every population to where you can talk to kindergartners about race and Black lives, to where you just have to Google these things. And there's so many resources that are coming out that are credible resources. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Rama Submarian at Texas A&M University literally just put out a Medium article where she talks about what white allies can do um, in these spaces. So there's lots of things that are coming out and they're coming out almost hourly to where just doing a, a deep dive into it and thinking about what population of children that you're working with or kids that you're working with and figuring out age appropriate things to talk about with them. But there are certainly ways in which you can talk about this at every single stage of, of childhood and adolescence development. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, question two that we have here, how is it best um, to discuss issues with those who are very defensive, especially in regard to the flag, taking a knee, Colin Kaepernick? Um, what is the best way to, to engage in those discussions? Well, I'll jump, I'll jump in on that first and foremost. Um, I, I find it very interesting that historically, um, when you look through American history and, and uh, any type of revolution or resistance that is done on behalf of the entire country, it's, it's praised, it's applauded. Um, Boston Tea Party is great. The American Revolution is great. Um, when, when revolution and resistance has a white face or a white frame, it, it's embraced as hero behavior. Um, when it has a brown face, um, when it has a non-white face, it's um, individuals are labeled savages and uh, a threat to the rule of law and the threat to our society. Um, I've, I've seen a number of different media outlets talking about the looting that's going on being a threat to American society as we know it and we need to shut it down right now or we'll lose America as we, as we know it to be. Um, and I, I think that's, that's an important thing to bring up. Um, I think the way we talk about, the way we frame the conversation around resistance, around freedom, what does freedom mean for uh, individuals within our society? Um, and how can we label resistance to oppression as oppressive? Like, it just doesn't make sense. If I'm resisting a system that has been, that has marginalized me, has killed me uh, and those who look like me and, and those who are otherwise marginalized that may not look like me, um, Resistance to that can't be that it's not it's not a system of oppression. It's a resistance to a system of oppression, um, and I think that's important to reinforce. Anybody else like to jump in on that? We can move on to the next question. Uh, question three from Alfonso: How do we use Black Lives Matter protests to effectively change institutional racism and oppressive pol policies? So I think that. The formula, you know, Black Lives Matter often um, takes a lot of heat for having a decentralized leadership um, model, but I think that you can actually, um, you should be able to see the benefit of having local and communal change um, and affecting local and communal change in the United States. The United States is far too large of a country and I mean that in terms of, uh, you know, the physical space, but I also mean in terms of the population to um, think through the application of these uh, concepts and demands and everything like that in every single space at one time. We live in radically different contexts. Um, Brooklyn, New York doesn't, well, I mean, you know, even talking about a whole Brooklyn, New York, it's like, oh gosh, it's a big place <laughs> with millions of people, um, you know, but Brooklyn, New York is not the same as Toledo, Ohio, is not the same as Austin, Texas. Um, and so to pretend as though there's one um, kind of sweeping um, uh, change that is needed, 
is to kind of minimize the, the nuance of each particular locale. And so what we have with Black Lives Matter and their local chapters is actually um, people who are asserting what changes need to happen where they live. Um, and that has in and of itself um, uh, the potential to affect larger scale change because we can see like, um, uh, like recent announcement in Minneapolis that there's a, there's a potential domino effect of doing something in your city um, or in your, uh, I'll say in your city, in your township, um, when other cities or towns that relate to you that say, hey, you know what, we look really similar to you. And that, that, that's a good idea, right? Um, you can affect change starting from your, your uh, locale. I think one thing that happens with the way that we learn American history um, is that we say, well, the civil rights movement won because they got uh, federal legislation passed. <laughs> and that's not, that's not true. It, it just undermines what was so grand about what was happening in the 50s and 60s. Um, so how do we use BLM protests to effectively change institutional racism and oppressive policies? I say, take a model from um, CURB, um, this organization in LA, uh, Californians United for a Responsible Budget. Brilliant organization. It, looks at their budget in their particular city and says, how do we shift these funds so that we can resource um, uh, the, the structures within society, these various institutions that need to be resourced, need better resourcing in order for us to have a less racist system, okay? Um, it's a wonderful organization. I, I do want to just shout out Curb <laughs> for that um, because this whole idea about defunding the police um, is one that is not necessarily new, even though, I mean, everybody, it, this is, it's wonderful that it's now, it's new to many people. The tactic itself isn't new. The idea isn't new, even if it's new to many people uh, individually. So look at what's happening. You know, um, um, we got this Google machine. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, SM. Um, question from Natasha. Can you discuss how using property taxes as the basis for funding education turns public education into a commodity rather than a basic right? I'll jump on that one. So the issue with using property taxes, what people historically don't understand is that a lot of areas that are majority black and brown, you have a very high renter population. Therefore, the tax base is lower um, for that particular area to where when towns, I'll use Long Island, for example, when townships look at how they distribute the funds, they don't necessarily always look at some of those issues with the rental properties and stuff to where if we look at specifically the town of Hempstead, if you look at the townships that got the majority of the state funding, or the ones that are already richer in the first place, so Rockville Center and Garden City, whereas your poorer communities like Hempstead um, Township and even Freeport got even lower amounts of the pot. It's not that they don't have people who are contributing and paying property taxes into it. It's the way that the funds are distributed and the representation of people in those townships is a lot more than people who are in those poor townships as far as being able to go to those town hall meetings, being at the decision table as far as how those funds are distributed. So it absolutely makes it more of a commodity of what town do you live in? What city do you live in? As far as what type of education, public education that you'll receive because the funding is just unequally distributed. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I, and I think it's just, it's so important. I mean, this is an aspect of how uh, institutionalized racism becomes normalized um, within our society. We all know what we mean when we, when we talk to family members or friends or our colleagues who want to live in a particular community so their kids can get to school. Um, we understand what that means. We don't call it racist. We just call it finding a good school and giving our, our, our kids the opportunities. Um, but the foundation of it is in inequality um, and unequal access and uh, not 
providing everyone with the same equal rights um, within our society. Question four uh, from Simon. Uh, I saw Jamal Joseph, former member of Black Panthers, uh, talking on NY1 about the virtues of building a rainbow coalition. Do you think this is a useful idea? I think that every panelist here would agree that allyship is 100% necessary. Um, but true allyship is not talking over the communities that you're trying to represent. It is figuring out ways to amplify their voices. So speaking with them and figuring out what are the interventions that they would suggest as opposed to here's what I think this community needs and whatever community that is, whether we're talking about black lives, if we're talking about trans rights, if we're talking about reproductive rights, whatever, the more people that are at the table and are voicing the same concerns that are working together in, you know, in, in building successful reforms, the better the outcome is going to be. But there has to be some, some listening and some recognition of where your place in the movement actually is. And having this rainbow idea is 100% great, but you can't be the leader of a group that you are not a part of. You need to be a part of it and figure out ways to, to, to help amplify those voices. Um, yeah, rest in peace, Fred Hampton. Um, rainbow coalitions. So coalitional politics are crucial um, to movements, but particularly if you want to have a radical movement. And when I say radical, I mean getting to the root of the issues. The movement that we need today needs to speak to transformative justice, looking at what structures created the various issues that we have so that we can um, uh, uh, redirect our attention from things like punishment and surveillance and lock them up and yada, 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 um, redirect all of that, right, into transforming our system at the root, right? Um, so what coalitional politics allow us to do, and I, 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 this is a bit different than allies, white allies or non-black allies joining a black movement, but um, is that uh, you have various groupings, various groups of people who um, have issues of their own, right? And they're working toward issues of their own, largely through, uh, say, community organizing. What happens is you get to see where all of these issues are connected. That is the virtue of coalitional politics. I can sit down with my Filipino brothers and sisters and siblings, and I can sit down with um, uh, white women in, you know, who are hashtagging me too, right? And I can sit down with, um, uh, you know, this, this uh, gay organization over here, this trans organization over here, et cetera. And we can all say, here, here is where I believe the harms that I'm experiencing come from, right? And within that, we raise our consciousness collectively, okay? Together, we all get to, oh, Me Too movement. You couldn't go to the police for that? What do you mean? What do you mean only 1%? <laughs> what do you mean only 1% to 10% of you end up going to the police? What do you mean only 1% to 2% of you actually have your issues recorded? What do you mean only 40% of those cases are ever cleared? Obviously, the police aren't helping you too much, are they? You see, <laughs> then you can shift attention and say, hey, um, what do you mean they're coming after you thinking that you're drug trafficking and they're they're taking away, they're detaining you without um, any reason, right? Um, what do you mean that they suspended habeas corpus in New York City for these protests? You see, then we say, oh, you know what? <laughs> I think some structural change has to happen. You see, then you go ahead and think about resource redistribution. You think about attention. You think about the needs that you have. You think about who can serve those needs, who is trained to serve those needs, you see, and you bring them in. That is a powerful movement. So do I believe in a rainbow coalition? Absolutely. Um, do I believe it can go <laughs> horribly wrong? Yeah, we've seen that as well. <laughs> we've seen that as well. And so I think that, um, 
uh, education, and I don't mean this through particular institutions, I don't mean go, you know, that you have to pay tuition somewhere to get this. I mean, educating yourself and your community members, political education is the cornerstone to any movement that is to thrive. All right, get together, speak to each other. Yeah, very, very good points, very good points. It, it, it makes me think of, I mean, looking at allyship and, and opportunities and also not using, not reinforcing the, the privilege and power dynamic when you go to become an ally, uh, when you make that move to, to join an, an allyship. Drew Brees, who's a football player for the uh, New Orleans Saints, had a big response uh, around the use of taking a knee with the American flag. And he, his question was presented to him and he got on his Instagram or Twitter and responded, would he take a knee? Would he support players taking a knee going forward? And he said, no, because it disrespects the flag. I'm not gonna disrespect the flag. My father, uh, my grandfather fought for this country in World War II. Um, huge backlash, look into it, Google it, you'll, you'll see the whole rundown. But one of the things that I'm, I'm focusing on it was his apology and the quote in his, in his apology said, um, bring it up, he says, he said he was wrong, he said he understood it from a different perspective. Um, he says, I recognize that I am a part of the solution and can be a leader for the black community in this movement. And that's completely the wrong thing to say. <laughs> He's not gonna become a leader in the black community. He needs to join hands with people who are doing the work. He needs to listen and find out where he can best be used by those who are leading the movement. Not take over the movement, not tell everybody where to go with the movement. Um, but that's an important thing that we all have to do is, and I, I see myself and hopefully those who are here see themselves as allies not to use any aspect of your privilege to try to overtake a, a movement or overtake um, support for a community. You don't become the community, you become an ally for the community. Black leadership matters. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> okay, we have another question from Otis. Um, he raises the, let's see, he's talking about the protesters who walked into the Michigan State House um, carrying guns and comparing that to Black Lives Matter pro protesters. Um, I guess the, the contrast between white men carrying guns into a, um, a, a governmental facility versus uh, protesters that are marching down the streets mostly peacefully um, and one's being seen as exercising their institutional rights and the other being, as, being seen as uh, threats to the society. Yeah, it's interesting how that happened and how that is framed, not just in conversations, but even how the media frames it. And one of the things that I've said in a number of media interviews that I've done over the last few days is that we have to shift the conversation using the language like thugs and looting and everything else. It has some very historical and racialized implications that people don't think about how that plays into the, the consciousness and the imaginations of viewers to where understanding those racial undertones and those implications, the educational components is, is quite important. I mean, I shared a resource on my, my personal social media that really talks about not just, you know, the, the phraseology that is exclusively to, to Black people as far as the, the racial undertones, but also looking at some of the, the terminology that we use just casually, how we've never thought about the language choices and how rhetoric words matter. I mean, that's my area of specialty, is that words absolutely matter. And thinking about how we can change those words and why it's important important to change that conversation has to start somewhere. And, and part of that has to be even educating our, our media representatives and students who are studying media about how do you cover things and how do you, you use certain language and how that creates certain realities, even if that is unintentional. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if I could take you back. Um, there are as I see it, there are two aspects um, that underlie this, this contrast between, uh, you know, marching with a gun to a federal building um, and uh, protests with one's hands up. Um, now, 
what we see is that one of these uh, forms of protest is formed by people who represent the state. And I actually, I won't say represent the state, I'll say represent the nation, okay? Um, the nation is how we identify with the country. Uh, the nation is, is, is the, the cultural body, um, the, the ideology, the identification, et cetera. Whereas the state is more like uh, the institutional body, the governing body. Um, we have people who represent the nation, um, who are at liberty to carry a gun and be assumed to be a rational actor, right? And what I mean by this is people will stop and say, hey, buddy, <laughs> why do you have that gun, right? Or people won't even stop them and say, hey, that's their right. And I'm sure that if, if he pulls the trigger, he had a reason that he can actually um, talk to us about and that we can hash out in court if there is an arrest or whatever it might be, right? Which is why um, white shooters are, if they don't kill themselves, they're often brought into court and they say, hey, buddy, <laughs> why did you do that, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, I want to start a race war, you know? Um, whatever. So the thing is, is that one in that body um, is able to carry that without dying first, like can actually make it to the federal building. Another set of protesters actually don't have that liberty. Okay. Um, and I say that not to um, undermine, uh, uh, you know, groupings of people who do within a protest um, uh, show that they have a right to carry like a rifle, for example, um, or anything like that. But it's that they can only do that when they are surrounded by thousands of other protesters um, who are not carrying anything, who are clearly unarmed, who are, you know, et cetera. And I'm saying this uh, uh, for those of you who, who know uh, recent events in Georgia with um, the new Black Panther Party. Um, so a crucial difference is that um, I, as I see it, the state is actually fearful of one and not of the other, okay? Um, I do believe uh, that there is a fear of the ideological and institutional change that will be brought out from mass peaceful protests, right? There is that fear, but it's not an immediate fear in the sense of cops are fairly certain that these people Black Lives Matter protesters are not going to open fire on them. Why? Because outside of slave revolts, that's historically, for the most part, unprecedented. Um, they cannot say the same thing for white protesters, um, you know, for their civil liberties to, to go out during a pandemic and yada, 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 um, that they're not going to open fire on them. <laughs> because there's no reason to believe that they aren't holding those arms with the intention to actually defend themselves. So the police are not meeting them with riot gear. They are not meeting them with armored tanks. They are not meeting with um, even their own guns because they actually know that these are escalation tactics and it's in their best interest to de-escalate white men with guns because they're actually the most dangerous, most threatening body in our country when they are armed. On the other hand, we have a historical precedent, precedent, um, not president, a historical precedent, and all of these books that we have been indoctrinated with um, in our history classes um, that tell us that Black lives um, should not be defended with lethal force. They should not be uh, defended with even preparation to do anything. You should just, you know, do an ideological defense where you turn the other cheek um, or, you know, you embrace a, a good Christian nonviolence that uh, Martin Luther King had ended up embracing later on in his career, um, but the part of the career that we understand and know. So that's why you see a huge difference in my, uh, in my analysis, in my perspective, um, between these uh, uh, two protests, two types of protests that are only happened a week apart is that militarization of the police um, was funded uh, to preempt a mass uh, uh, protest by largely racialized people and those who ally with them. 
the militarization of the police did not happen um, to respond to white men with guns. Thank you. Um, Question, what about diverting police funding to other services or programs? What programs should be, should that funding go to? And this we, we touched on this a little earlier, um, looking at some of the steps that some cities, locales are taking, um, even conversations here, well, not here, but in New York City um, about moving funding. There's been no, um, well, as far as New York City and, and Mayor de Blasio, he hasn't been specific about what will be moved, but he said he's he's open to uh, making a shift in the the funding. But what 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 services, what programs should be funded in place of uh, police? So there's a myriad of of different ways to approach public safety, since a number of people are concerned about public safety. Like, what do I do if you know something happens? If someone is you know overdosing, any of those types of things. And there's a number of wonderful programs that this funding could go to, to where we could have you know trainers, like we have people who are unarmed, urgent responders that know about mental health. We can put more money into mental health um, practices and stuff. We can look at, you know, if there's someone who is having a mental health crisis, having trained responders that can come in, mental health workers that can come in to work with them. If there are incidents that involve gun violence, having trauma-informed crisis intervention teams that are available who know how to de-escalate those things, much like Dr. Rodriguez talked about, not just cops responding with violence too, but also trained specifically to de-escalate. If there's someone who's having intimate partner violence or domestic disputes, having, you know, trauma-informed crisis intervention specialists coming in. If there's someone who's sleeping on park benches, since we have a number of, of cities and stuff that are dealing with the homeless population, having someone who's actually trained to come in and check in about the, the welfare of people to go in and do um, intervention checks on sleeping, food, water, shelter, health care, any of those types of things. If there's someone who has an overdose, having substance abuse counselors in place, there's so many ways in which we can be actually more safe by putting funding into intervention and de-escalation and education too about why these things are, are bad. And you, can, you could use public police departments to do it, not our current structure of police departments, but actually using them as public Public safety offices, as opposed to continuing to put money into um, riot gear and other things that we know actually escalate conflicts. Um, are you going to add something to this? Because I want. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I saw that you were unmuted. Um, so I, I do want to uplift the work um, of a few people who have been writing about this for a long time, and there are many, I'll say, um, like Beth Ritchie, um, who, um, whose work um, inspired, who founded the uh, Survived and Punished um, uh, Collective. There's Mimi Kim, um, there's Mariam Kaba. These, uh, these, uh, women of color, feminists of color, um, have actually been working on this for a very long time. In fact, if you look at um, INCITE, I-N-C-I-T-E, um, exclamation point, um, they've put out many of uh, kind of helpful little resources that are either free, right, freely available, or, um, uh, or very, very um, inexpensive that are very helpful. Um, including the revolution will not be funded. Um, then the uh, other one that I would uplift for those of you who have an Instagram um, at Mele Gurma um, has been putting out work that I think is really fantastic and does um, get to this question. Um, so yes, Dr. Robinson said most of everything that I would have said anyways, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, actually, pretty much everything that I would have said. I will say one thing um, that's not what programs should that funding go to, but what it shouldn't go to. Um, and uh, with this, I, I'll 
I'll uplift um, Liat Ben Moshe's work, um, who um, actually just wrote a, a book on decarcerating disability. Um, what it shouldn't go to is any form of incarceration for people with mental illness um, or people who are uh, considered mad. It should not go to reforms that force medication on people. Um, it should not go to um, building up or rebuilding asylums and these types of things. Um, we got rid of them for a reason. Abolition of incarceration has actually uh, happened in this country. <laughs> this is, um, it's just the type of incarceration was for largely middle and upper class white people who were forced into asylums, a lot of them being women um, who were deemed crazy for not wanting to participate in society in certain ways. Um, and so I will say that um, one part of funding, of course, critical funding um, should go into our education. And I say that we need education that um, destigmatizes mental illness. Many of the people, about half of the people um, who are killed by the police, um, even uh, black people who are killed by the police have uh, mental illness or mental health concerns. Um, so this intersection between disabled and black is the deadliest of them all. Um, do not <laughs> support refunds that invest in incarcerating um, these people either in their own bodies through forced pharmaceuticals or in other institutions that look a lot like prisons. All right. Um, also, yeah, don't fund prisons. Those, those are key points. I think one, one thing I want to reinforce is the importance of still staying politically engaged and politically active outside of uh, election time. It's, a, it's definitely important to vote, but it's also important that your voice be heard um, and that your interests are met in between those times that we vote. We vote and, you know, we still have to hold those who we elect accountable. I think that's very important. Um, the next question, uh, therapeutic jurisprudence um, and diversion programs wait until people first enter the system. Any thoughts on approaches that can keep people from being hard herded uh, into the system in the first place? The types of interventions um, that Dr. Robinson was talking about do address this. Um, do not have police oversee therapy, <laughs> wellness calls, not, uh, none of that should happen. Police are absolutely not trained um, to deal with that in any significant training. They do not have the type of training that any counselor has, that any therapist has, that even people who are out on the streets have um, in terms of um, you know, teams of people who are engaged in community organizing or even people who work at you know, nail salons. There's absolutely none. <laughs> um, and so how do we um, avoid hurting in people into the criminal justice system? It starts off by um, divesting from police. Yeah, I'm going to highlight one program um, that we know um, through a lot of research has been completely ineffective. And it's a program that's still largely popular, the D.A.R.E. program. So the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program that were put into schools. We know that these are ineffective because it's cops coming in and introducing kids to here's all the drugs and here's the things that's going to be bad. But more effective program is actually having substance abuse counselors going in and talking about these issues and stuff and talking about the real experiences and stuff that that happen when um when you're dealing with addiction and the aftermath of it so there's different ways to just shift that conversation and as dr rodriguez said it's not involving police in public safety um, in environments and in public safety education type programs. There are more effective and proven methodologies that, that we should be investing in. Thank you. Um, how can we as individuals um, and as organizations make sure that progress continues even after the outrage is over? Sustaining work, you know, um, Audre Lorde said revolution is not a one-time event. Um, and, and that's to speak to uh, uh, the, the constant work it takes to sustain uh, a movement for change, for ideological change, for institutional change. Um, 
well, uh, okay, I'll just say all of the, the eyes, um, <laughs> individual change changes to our internal uh, 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 ecosystems as well. Um, so what does that mean? Um, well, I think uh, one, for those of you who are funding, um, I see this as, um, so I'm on the board of directors for the Audrey Lord project. Um, I see this as uh, someone who has been involved with a community organization for a very long time. Um, outrage is short lived. Um, and what follows outrage is kind of this mass of funding, um, which is great, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> all organizations will appreciate resources, but resources and funding and a one-time donation are not the same thing. Um, so for those of you who are inclined um, or who have capacity or maybe only capacity to fund uh, an organization, set up recurring donations, even if it's a yearly one, Think about, you know, how can you budget in, in, in your life? How can you budget in so that a donation is recurring rather than one time, okay? And um, that's, that's very important for organizations that are attempting to sustain under a capitalist model. Um, uh, it's, it's, it just is. Um, but I think on top of that, um, and outside of funding, think about resources more generally. Think about knowledge as a resource. Think about um, your, your own body as a resource, right? Organizations such as the one that I've worked with um, rely on people for security. And you know what? We do security year round. We have security for all of our events. We have security for all of our protests and our marches. I was a security um, uh, person. I was a person who provided security for protests and marches for years, about six years, okay? So understand that resources expand far out of your, uh, uh, you know, pockets and your wallets, your salary. Um, and instead, think about how reading groups um, and that consciousness raising effort can contribute to a revolution. I also want to um, underscore a point that my colleague Cornell made about Voting. So yes, voting is important. Informed voting is what I advocate for to where you know the positions of the people that you're electing. But also it doesn't just happen when you're voting for them. It's actually holding them accountable, knowing their voting records, knowing what legislation and reforms that they are supporting. And if they are not actually representing you, letting them know that by calling them, emailing them, showing up to their offices. I'm an advocate for the, the FaceTime that sometimes gives an even deeper impact than just reading an email or just getting a phone call. But it's, it's, it's constant. It's staying informed constantly. And I know that that sounds very exhausting. And as Dr. Rodriguez said, there's many ways that you can support organizations. But I also, I, I can't reiterate the importance of having a holding representatives accountable. If they're not doing it, they're not listening, vote them out. Vote for someone else who actually represents your interests and the reforms that you want to see in your community, not just on the national level. Pay attention to the local level because that's what impacts you the most. Very true. And because our time is winding down, we're going to do a lightning round. So only, you know, short answers and we got to go, go quick. So... The next question, this is for SM. Uh, how do you assess the international Black Lives Matter protests, i.e. the one in London and, and other, other areas? Uh, international Black Lives Matter protests are important. I think that there are a few things to understand within them. Um, there is a tension outward and there's a tension inward. For London, please pay attention to the ways um, that racialized policing has occurred in your country. Um, uh, historically speaking, and also today, please realize that borders, um, well, one, imperialism and, and uh, the British uh, responsibility for prisons today, um, all of them, um, is a backdrop that means that um, you're in no way, um, your country's in no way innocent or indemnified from the harm that they have caused um, to the entire world. So hold your own country responsible. Um, thank you so much for your solidarity. Also, look inward. Um, uh, I'll also say that um, 
the importance of looking outward, right, of holding another country um, accountable for the harm that that country is doing to its own uh, uh, residents is, um, well, we can see that with the African Union um, that has uh, called the United States out for state terrorism against Black people, um, uh, people of African descent in this country. Um, the more uh, countries that unite to speak out against the type of violence, um, the genocidal acts, um, the types of violence and the state terrorism that the United States has engaged in with this particular population, um, the more likely we are to have some form of accountability post-Trump. And I say post-Trump very importantly because it's not about this president. This has been happening far, far longer, uh, uh, far earlier, and it will continue to occur far longer. Uh, next question, uh, what reforms can we demand from candidates um, and elected officials, particularly at the state level? So I think it all depends on what community and state that you're in. I think that that answer varies. So it's start first doing some research on what community level organizing is already being done or state level organizing is already being done. I spent this morning talking to a community organizer in Austin, Texas, who specifically is talking about two laws that they're trying to repeal that most people don't even know about that insulate the police. And specifically, it gives police unions negotiating powers with the city. It it also makes it extremely hard to fire a police officer, even if they have done um, some misconduct. So they are starting to mobilize and starting to get more people connected to that movement to try to raise awareness and to get people, um, get the elected officials to vote against this legislation and to think through the reforms. So I say do some research, figure out what's happening in your local communities, figuring out what's happening in your state, see what organizing is already taking place, and then figure out ways to get involved with that organizing if you do, in fact, agree with the, the reforms that they are requesting. Okay, thank you. Um, this question from Stephanie, she's asking about uh, what Hofstra is doing to address systemic um, racism and percentage of uh, black faculty and staff, students and staff and students. Um, this is something that's been a focus of mine since I since I started this. I'm into just starting into my second year um, at Hofstra, but looking at ways in which we go about hiring, um, start searches, um, training search committees on implicit bias, understanding how bias plays a role in decision making. The more research shows, the more we talk about it, the more we're aware of it. Um, the less impact it can have. It's not about eliminating, eliminating the impact of implicit bias, but it's about becoming aware of it. Um, that's something I'm focused on. Of course, currently in, the, in this corona state that we're in and this financial crisis that we're in, um, not, there's not gonna be a lot of movement right this second, but I wanna put the structures in place that we go about searches and giving individuals opportunities to um, join in with the Hofstra community. Um, that are people of color that have things to add to our community, uh, in, including what they bring to the table intellectually, but also what they bring to the table um, as far as their experience and their representation. Representation is very valuable. Um, Hofstra is a predominantly white institution, um, and predominantly white institutions have a little more work to do um, than Hispanic serving institutions or historically black colleges and universities to make sure that they have um, equal opportunity and equal access from the faculty level all the way down to which students they recruit and, and what um, parts of the country we recruit students from. Another question. Um, Kevin asked a question, what suggests that talking about what happened um, as far as protests creates a smokescreen effect that makes or prevents people from talking about why the protests happened? So talking about all the all the aspects and all the moving parts and the looting and distracting from the, the purpose. Anyone want to take that one? I think it was a, a comment, maybe more than a, a question. For lightning round purposes. Yeah, that very true, very true. We'll we'll take it as a comment. And, and it's very important, it's very true. It's very true that there's been a lot of uh, distractions. Um, which is the better route for police reform? 
uh, change the culture, as Dr. Robinson suggested, or by creating new positions or shrink the police department portfolio and suppl supplement with new resources? So I would actually advocate for both. So I think that we need to change the culture of it, but also think about how can we redistribute funding and support to other resources and stuff and use it as supplemental. So I think that they both work in conjunction with this. Um, and I'm gonna leave that because we have a minute left and I see we have another question. Yes, and the last question, what can, high, what can a high schooler do to help Black Lives Matter? High schoolers are powerful. Um, listen, uh, don't let anyone give you some ageist crap about your limitations in a movement, all right? Even if you're stuck in the house because you're not actually allowed to go out, I understand. <laughs> I, I, I actually remember those days. But um, <laughs> one, you can go out and protest, okay? If, as long as your parents allow it. Um, note that you, well, one, uh, you know, with, coronavirus um, and with uh, uh, police brutality, um, we are in a moment that is very, uh, you know, highlights some vulnerabilities. Do not vape. I know that this is a thing for Gen Z. Please do not vape. Um, we have currently a, a virus that can be aerosolized, which means it goes into the air, it spreads through what you're doing with vapes you're blowing out a virus. You are blowing out a virus that everyone behind you is going to march into. Do not do it. It is a self-defeating tactic, all right? Um, that goes for tear gas as well that they're, that um, police are throwing, goes for anything um, uh, like that. But on top of that, um, do the consciousness raising in your school. Form a, a, a Black Lives Matter high school chapter. Um, you know, go through these readings together. Invite, you know, reach out because there are professors in local community um, colleges, in colleges um, that are just outside or on um, uh, universities nearby that will join you. I would love to lead a discussion for high schoolers. Just ask literally ask, it will cost nothing for most of us because we're so into this chain. I'm not saying don't pay us anything. If you have some money, no, okay, uh, <laughs> no, but we'll join. We would love to join, okay? So understand that you can do consciousness raising and it's important to do consciousness raising in your high school. You can join a, a movement. Um, there are so many, Fred Hampton was a kid. I mean, there are some of the most radical um, uh, people in history were our youth. So understand that there are youth organizations or there, if there isn't one in your area, you can start it, all right? Youth are our future, we rely on you, you are powerful, you have a voice, please don't allow anyone to tell you otherwise. Yeah, all of our voices and bodies are necessary to this, regardless of our identities, um, regardless of our age, any of those things, all of us are necessary for bringing about real change. So we are now out of time, we're a little over time, but I wanna thank you all for listening to us. I wanna thank my colleagues, um, Dr. Rodriguez and Cornell Craig for joining us today for this. And we are happy to answer other questions. And I believe Cornell has a slide with you know an email um, for, do you have that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I did have that, but I, I, I deleted it. Um, but one thing I will say for the, there's a Long Island Progressive Coalition as far as ways to get involved in Long Island, um, looking at some of the things they're doing. Um, and as far as internally, um, for those within the Hofstra community, um, diversity inclusion, diversity inclusion at Hofstra.edu. Um, that's an email address to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion um, for any other continued contact and, and uh, communication forward. Thank you.